Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Considerations for Insulating Ducts in Exterior and Unconditioned Spaces. My name is Kim Melton, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's presentation. Joining me are Brennan Hall and Lance Bonin from Johns Manville, as well as Tom Sheehan from Damon Insulation. Um, but before we get into introductions, I do want to go over a few logistics. First is that we'll be concluding the webinar with a live Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can submit them via the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. Now, if you don't see that box, there's actually um, a series of little round buttons across the bottom of the main part of your screen. If you simply click the Q&A button, that's going to open up a, a dialog box on the right side of your screen that you can use to submit questions. Also, we're frequently asked whether or not we send out these presentations upon their conclusion. And while we don't actually share the presentation itself, we do post a recording of it online. And that way you can watch it at your leisure or share it with your colleagues. And this also ensures that you have the presentation within its full context. So now this is all really part of how we deliver the JM experience to you. At Johns Manville, the JM experience is part of our culture. And it's based on four primary pillars. And that's people, passion, perform, and protect. Now, we offer webinars like this one to help educate the market and offer a tool um, or a resource for you and your business as you need it. So we're continuously striving to improve these and make them better. Um, and at the, at the conclusion of the webinar, we offer a survey. And if you could take some time and fill out that survey, that would, um, we'd, we'd encourage you to do that because we take your feedback and we use it to improve our webinars and provide you with the information that has the most value to you. So on that note, we'll get to introductions and we'll kick off with Brennan. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Brennan Hall. I am the HVAC product manager for Johns Manville Insulation. Uh, I have been with Johns Manville for uh, three years. I'm responsible for our duct wrap, duct liner, and duct board product lines. Uh, and I have been within the HVAC industry for just about uh, a little over 10 years now. Hi, I am Lance Bonin. I am the mechanical portfolio leader for Johns Manville. Uh, been with Johns Manifold for 19 years and in the industry for 19 years as well. Uh, in the mechanical insulation portfolio, we have fiberglass pipe insulation. We have board insulations uh, for exterior ducting, and we also have PVC fittings. Hello, my name is uh, Tom Sheehan. Uh, I have 31 years of industry experience. I've spent many of those years in the field as an installer, a uh, supervisor, a project manager, and now is the principal of the Damon Insulation Company. The Damon Insulation Company is located in the Northeast. Uh, we are, are a mechanical insulation contractor. Uh, we work in the pharmaceutical, institutional, commercial, marine, and industrial fields. And my goal today is to share some of my knowledge and inspire some innovative thinking. All right, I am going to go ahead and get us kicked off here with influential code changes. Uh, the International Energy Conservation Code. The International Energy Conservation Code is the building code that establishes the minimum design and construction requirements for energy efficiency. The International Code Council, or ICC, and the U.S. Department of Energy Building Energy Codes Program, or BECP, collaborate to provide the latest in building energy code products and services to assist code officials. Internationally, code officials recognize the need for a modern, up-to-date energy conservation code addressing the design of energy-efficient building envelopes and installation of energy-efficient mechanical, lighting, and power systems through requirements emphasizing performance. Introduced in 1998 and continuing the leadership role in energy codes that the ICC legacy organization started over 20 years before that, the International Energy Conservation Code, or IECC, addresses energy efficiency on several fronts including cost savings, reduced energy usage, conservation of natural resources, and the impact of energy usage on the environment. As an alternative for one and two family dwellings, the International Residential Code, or IRC, provides prescriptive energy provisions that can be easily implemented and are consistent with IECC provisions. The IECC and code change process. The Code Council performs periodic revisions of its model codes through a defined process that allows outside participation from stakeholders, including public and governmental entities. Once the revision process is completed, a new edition of the model code is published. States and local jurisdictions can then reference these codes to legislate increased energy efficiency in buildings through their adoption processes. 
Both the IECC and ASHRAE Standard 90.1 are developed, revised, and adopted in open public forums through a voluntary consensus process. Code adoption. The adoption of model codes presents a significant opportunity to save energy in residential and commercial buildings. The United States does not have a nationally preemptive energy code or standard for buildings other than the manufactured housing segment. So energy codes are adopted at the state and local levels of government. Through the Building Energy Codes Program, or BECP, the Department of Energy, or DOE, provides technical assistance to state and local governments to help facilitate the code adoption process. This comprehensive collection of information and support includes the tracking of state adoption status, coordinating activities among stakeholders, technical analysis, and technical assistance, which is all designed to answer questions and address issues that you may have related to specific energy codes. The 2015 IECC R12 duct insulation. So now that you're kind of up to date on the codes, the resources to understand the code, and how the code cycle works, let's talk about one of the requirements we're starting to see within the 2015 energy code cycle. That requirement is for R12 duct insulation. Most of you are probably aware that typical HVAC duct insulation ranges from R2 up to R8 traditionally for fiberglass insulation. In the 2015 energy code, there's some new verbiage that is being inserted into section C403.2.9. This section, section states the following. Duct and plenum insulation and ceiling. Supply and return air ducts and plenums shall be insulated with a minimum of R6 insulation where located in unconditioned spaces and where located outside the building with a minimum of R8 insulation in climate zones 1 through 4 and a minimum of R12 insulation in climate zones 5 through 8. Where located within a building envelope assembly, the duct or plenum shall be separated from the building exterior or unconditioned or exempt spaces by a minimum of R8 insulation in climate zones one through four, and a minimum of R12 insulation in climate zones five through eight. So just to kind of recap what that section of the code states, it's basically telling you that exposed ducts or ducts in unconditioned spaces will require R8 insulation in climate zones one through four, and R12 insulation will be required in zones five through eight if your local area is enforcing the 2015 IECC. There are two exemptions that are listed, which are when the insulation is located within the equipment itself or when the temperature difference between the interior and exterior of the duct or plenum is less than or equal to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Where should I be using R12 insulation? Here's a color-coded map of the climate zones within the United States as defined by the ICC. You will see the climate zones listed ranging from one down in South Florida in the Miami area all the way up to zone seven and eight as we reach into the northernmost tier, the lower 48, and up into Alaska. Per the 2015 code, if the state or local municipality you are in has started enforcing the 2015 IECC code and you are in climate zones five through eight with ductwork in exposed outside of the building envelope applications, such as an exposed rooftop duct run or an open air parking garage or within the building envelope, envelope itself in unconditioned space, then R12 insulation is what is being required for those applications. Again, this is only if you are in an area that is for enforcing the 2015 IECC and you are located in one of the designated climate zones. Should I be following the 2015 IECC? Or should I be using the 2015 IECC? Well, that depends really on where you're located. Uh, as you can see in this map, the color coding shows a wide range of code adoptions and enforcement areas across the country. Different states are in different phases of the previous code cycles in terms of actual code adoption. Codes tend to take a long time to become implemented as well as enforced, so just make sure to keep up with the, and understand the cycle of the code of where your project is located geographically. If your jurisdiction has adopted the 2015 IECC, then the prescriptive requirements outlined in the codes are obligatory. The IECC resource page. So if you're not sure what code you're operating under, there's hope, there's tools, don't panic. Uh, the IECC resource page has an abundance of good information out there to help you out. Uh, every state and municipality is different, so it's important to check with local code officials and use the tools and resources provided to make sure you're following the code correctly for your area. At the bottom of this page, there is a link that will take you there. Once we publish this, it'll be available and you can go back and review it. Uh, after this and you can download it, but there is a page out there through the IECC website that can help you get to all this information very quickly and easily. 
So meeting the code requirements. So what's so challenging about R12 insulation? Well, there really has not been an easily accessible R12 fiberglass product readily available from the manufacturers to meet the R12 application. Traditional fiberglass offerings range from R2 up to R8 typically given the nature of the product being used from a fiberglass standpoint. In order to reach an R12 thermal requirement, contractors have had to either double, double layer, either duct wrap or duct liner, or some sort of combination type fiberglass system to reach an installed R12. This means more time and labor for the contractor, which in turn costs a lot more money. And there's also been some equipment limitations that are still out there today that can cause some challenges as well with this. What about non-fiberglass options? Um, non-fiberglass options can be costly, they can be time intensive to, to install, and they might not meet the specific fire and safety code requirements that you're needed, that are needed. Please make sure to check all the alternative materials you are, you are using and make sure that all the proper test standards and requirements have been noted to be used as duct insulation. So what are my fiberglass duct liner options? So what you're seeing here on the screen is three different options to reach R12 insulation. The first one I'm going to talk to is in the upper left-hand corner, and that's our traditional uh, uh, line acoustic RC duct liner uh, by Johns Manville. About six weeks or so ago, uh, we introduced the first ever three-inch R12 rolled flexible fiberglass duct liner. It has our uh, Johns Manville permacoat coating. It's our proprietary coating on the Airstream surface the black surface that you're seeing there uh, that provides antimicrobials as well as superior water repellency. Uh, we've had a lot of interest in this product so far. We're starting to see the product move out into the market through our distribution channels, contractors and engineers alike are asking for it as the word gets out there. Uh, I expect this to continue to grow as more and more codes are adopted out there. So uh, very excited to have this in the offering portfolio uh, with our, with our uh, line acoustic RC duct liner product. Um, the next one is in the middle uh, is our Line Acoustic R300 product. This is our three inch rigid plenum board liner or board liner. It typically comes in a four by eight sheet and also has our proprietary Johns Manville antimicrobial coating. So this product is kind of the board form to kind of partner up with our rolled form of our newly launched three inch R12 RC product. So you have a rolled form and a board form product. Um, the third option down here is our, is our Spiral SG product. That's the yellow insulation that you're seeing there inside of that spiral pipe. Um, this is a double wall spiral pipe application. Double wall meaning that there is a, a metal core on the inside that can be either solid or perforated, wrapped with a fiberglass blanket or our Spiral SG product, and then taken and slid into uh, the outer metal shell. Uh, so thus you have a double wall, uh, two layers of metal sandwiching one layer of fiberglass. That Spiral SG product, we do have a four inch offering that will allow you to reach R12. So Across the whole duct liner portfolio right now, you can get it in a rolled form, you can get it in a, a board form, or you can get it in a double wall for spiral pipe, so meeting the applications of both rectangular and spiral pipe needs. Uh, the next one is what are my external duct options? So options for, for wrapping a duct or the exterior of a duct, if you will. Um, the first one here, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag here. So um, we are uh, going to be introducing our uh, Microlite FSK, which is our uh, standard uh, uh, foil reinforced scrim uh, duct liner product, or duct wrap product, excuse me. It will be 4.4 inches thick, uh, and that's coming soon. As soon as we launched the, the duct liner product, the next question that came out of most people's mouth was, what about a duct wrap? Are you going to have that out? So uh, working them in kind of in parallel, uh, I would expect this here. Uh, to be hopefully out with a product in the next four to six weeks. We're just finalizing all of our stuff internally in terms of packaging and literature, data sheets, and making sure that everything's ready to go. Um, but hopefully we'll have that out soon and available for purchase for you guys in the marketplace. The next one is our spin glass board or our mechanical spin glass board. Uh, my counterpart, Lance, will kind of talk a little bit more about the next two products more in detail and depth. But we do offer a three-inch external uh, board for mechanical rooms and duct application uh, with an with a array of faced or unfaced products that are available for, for you to reach in R12. And then we also have our XPEC polyiso foam here, which is for external of the building envelope applications only. And uh, that's one of the newer products to the portfolio on the mechanical side of our business. Uh, that, we'll, that Lance will get into. So uh, really excited about what we have option-wise to meet the R12 codes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lance and let him kind of talk about insulating exterior ducts. Okay, so exterior ducts have a number of unique challenges based on their location outside the building envelope. 
Like most all ducts with conditioned air, an, an insulation thickness or R value will be specified that's effective for the conditions that are likely to be experienced. Because of the more extreme conditions outside the building envelope, generally thicker insulations are specified. And as we've reviewed in this webinar, the codes are changing to address this reality. An exterior duct insulation may need to be effective in both extreme heat or cold, and depending on the location of the geography. In addition, both liquid moisture and humidity can be a factor that must be mitigated to ensure the desired level of performance. Special care needs to be taken to ensure the duct is properly sealed and weatherproofed. And we'll address these issues in more detail as we continue through the webinar. Exterior ducts often experience a greater level of human interaction after installation. Duct insulations need to be effective in limiting the potential abuses that can be present with people unfamiliar with how insulations work. Ideally, ducts are never walked on or used for temporary storage or a resting place for tools or equipment. However, these interactions can happen and the right insulation and cladding can limit the degree of impact from these activities. Relatively higher degrees of rigidity and compressive strength can work to mitigate the unintentional abuses that can happen to an exterior duct. Additionally, steps unrelated to the insulation can be taken during installation to mitigate the potential for damage. Because exterior ducts are often found on rooftops or other difficult to reach locations around the building, an insulation that is strong, lightweight, easy to fabricate, and in available and efficient configurations can make the installation process go more quickly and increase the likelihood of a professional looking and finished installed appearance. And Tom's gonna to be providing more details on these activities shortly. For many years, and still in many locations, spin glass and other fiberglass board products are the insulation of choice for exterior ducting. Material is readily available in thicknesses that range from one inch to four inch, offering R values of four to 16. These types of insulations are an excellent value for the thermal performance they provide. And they come with several different facing styles, including a foil scrim craft or FSK facing, like shown in the boards stacked on the top in the picture. Fiberglass boards, this is typically the facing of choice for an exterior application. Johns Manville is working on a version of the facing that is made without paper, which we will believe will be available later this year. This type of jacketing would deliver the moisture control performance typically found with an FSK or an, an ASJ jacket. And all these fiberglass board jacket systems, once sealed with a vapor barrier tape, form a vapor barrier for the insulation that's effective vapor retarder. And it's important to note that fiberglass insulation boards, like all fiberglass insulations, are open cell. And it's critical that the vapor barriers and the weatherproof cladding are maintained to ensure the moisture does not get into the insulation. If moisture is present within the insulation, that can uh, lead to loss of effectiveness and thermal performance or an increased uh, risk of condensation on the duct. It's also important to note that fiberglass boards are semi-rigid. They can provide a good looking and finished appearance and greater strength than a flexible fiberglass insulation. They do need to have their thickness maintained to ensure the specified thermal performance is met. So abuse that crushes the insulation may require replacement or repair. So polyiso insulation boards like Expect Isofoam offer a number of advantages for exterior ducting. The product is a closed cell insulation with low moisture permeability. This means that the insulation itself can continue to perform in the presence of moisture. In addition, the foil facing can be sealed with tape to create a vapor barrier that will reduce the risk of condensation forming on the exterior duct and prevent moisture from getting into joints that can create a thermal short. Polyiso boards come in a range of thickness. Expect comes in thicknesses from one inch to four inch in half inch increments. So inch and a half insulation is as readily available as two inch. The R value per inch is roughly R6, but improves slightly with thicker boards. So for example, an Expect insulation at two inches of thickness would have an R value of 13. In comparison to many alternatives, the compressive strength of Expect is a good bit higher. The JM product has a compressive strength 
of 16 pounds per square inch. This level of strength helps with durability of the product during and after installation, and it resists crushing that can lead to loss in thermal performance. In addition, the product is lightweight, so large, efficient to install boards are easy to handle, and polyiso is easy to fabricate on the job site as well. A couple of drawbacks for polyiso insulations can be with meeting codes for flame spread and smoke development. The International Mechanical Code makes no distinction between an interior and an exterior duct. Therefore, some local code bodies may choose to enforce the 25 flame spread 50 smoke development requirements. In a situation like this, polyiso boards are likely not the best option, since typically they have smoke development greater than 50. How often, very often, the local code bodies value the advantages of polyiso, like higher R value and greater strength for these external duct applications and discount the risk of the smoke development. Another potential drawback for polyiso can be that over time the insulation loses some of its thermal performance. This can happen as gases used to create the polyiso board disperse over time and are replaced by air molecules in the board. However, in the case of XPEC isofoam, the foil facing has a mitigating effect on this issue and tends to slow the process when compared to polyiso products with permeable facing. If this factor is critical to the specifier, the long-term thermal rating of the product can be evaluated. And this is a commonly available measure for polyiso insulations. So a couple other options would be a pre-engineered duct system that incorporates the duct, the insulation, and the cladding all in one product. The duct system is available in a variety of thicknesses that drive R values from R8 to R24. Elastomeric foam rubber insulations may be used on external ducts. These types of insulations are closed cell with low vapor permeability. They're flexible and require a cladding for external use, just as most any other insulation system requires for an external application. Our value here ranges in about R4 per inch. Both types of systems, the manufacturer's website should be consulted for the installation guides and other product specific information. So I'll turn it over to Tom now, who's gonna to talk to us about uh, installation practices. Thank you, Lance. Uh, I wanted to thank JM for hosting this forum. A lot of great information has been presented so far. Uh, I'm gonna switch gears a bit from the technical aspects more to applications. Um, in most mechanical insulation applications, in practice, uh, they're a composite of products. They're products from multiple producers, multiple manufacturers, and you combine these products to make an effective system. Each component is relying on the other to deliver a quality product in the end, and the goal is to meet the specification and the intent of design. So today, I'm presenting on the composite system for rooftop duct insulation. It's an application that's very common in the industry. It's uh, for ductwork located out on a roof outdoors, um, an HVAC duct externally insulated, uh, and these ducts I'm referring to are rectangular ducts. So the focus today will be on the XPECT polyiso foam insulation that JM is rolling out. It's a great product. Um, we're going to focus on this product combined with an outdoor weather jacket. And the reason I choose polyiso as my preferred product is for many of the reasons that I've been mentioned so far, it's a, a great installation to install on an outdoor rooftop duct. And I prefer it for its compressive strength, its permeability rating, it has great absorption rates, and its performance over time in tough outdoor conditions. So we'll discuss some products, um, some procedures, uh, my choices, my approach, some techniques, some details, and I'm gonna advise you on some possible failure points. Um, so the order of operations that takes place on any project, uh, you have to identify and pre-plan and the delivery of your materials and the details you're gonna implore on the job, your safety plan. Um, I'm just gonna to touch briefly on some safety points on this installation. 
and then the execution of the project. Um, so in the execution, we've got physical delivery, pinning the duct, insulating the duct, prepping the pins to finish, prepping the corners, sealing our vapor barrier, external lagging, and then demobilization. Uh, that's a lot of information to work out. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So let's get started. Uh, polyiso materials, as previously discussed, they're affected by UV. And you want to protect your materials from the sun. It's very important and that you stage your materials properly and you don't leave your materials outside for long periods of time unprotected. So you'll have to make decisions uh, that are related to your delivery schedule and your capacity to install the material as a finished product. So long-term storage of polyiso outdoors on a roof, it can be problematic. Um, you want to make sure you maintain the original factory packaging and you use additional tarps and protect the product from the sun and keep it from denigrating outside. Um, the approach we like to use is finish what you start. Uh, that's an approach that gets great results. You move through a rooftop duct application in sections and your team can complete so much work in a given period of time. I like to go on a two week plan of attack. Um, the keys to a successful system. Um, you have to support the material that you're using, the poly ISO board uh, with other components. And one of those major components involved in this system is your pin system. There's basically two types of common pin systems. There's a weld pin system. Uh, that may be a, a weld pin or a cupped head pin. And then there's the chemical perforated pin. Um, I would never recommend using a self-adhesive pin outside uh, on a duct system. I wouldn't recommend it using a self-adhesive pin. That's a peel and stick pin. Uh, on any duct for that matter. Um, they're not very reliable. My preference, my choice is the chemically adhered perforated pin. Uh, Gemco is a manufacturer of the perforated base pins. There's a couple manufacturers of the glue. It's available in a low VOC compound and it will meet most specification requirements. I like the system because it's repeatable and there's no power, uh, very low failure rate, and it forces some pre-planning of your work and that's a good thing. Uh, it forces you to pin out what you can insulate in a week or two, depending on how you've laid out your job. And that's gonna help you have a successful project. In laying out your pins, it's very important to lay your pins out. They're gonna be a, uh, a major feature in your finished product. So you wanna lay those rows out straight, level, uh, vertically and perpendicular. You want to run them 18 inches on center. You want to try and stay no more than four inches from any leading edge of the duct. Um, the pin system is a real critical point in the success of this system, and you want to install them meaningfully. Uh, the next big aspect of a rooftop duct insulation system is to pitch your roof. Um, the polyiso board comes in a tapered form, and it's available in board form, four foot by four foot sections, and the pitch is generally half inch per foot, and that's fairly standard, and that's a, uh, the proper amount of pitch. You wanna try to maintain that pitch on all flat roofs. You have to lay it out and decide if you're gonna run a shed roof from one end to the other, or you're gonna run a center pitch, a more traditional roof like in the photo. Um, you, you just have to, to plan out the pitch, and. When you ask why pitch the roofs, uh, the answer is uh, basically snow loads and rain. Those things are gonna compromise your system. Uh, you need to get the water off. You don't want any ponding or pooling in the centers of the roof of your duct. It's gonna lead to failure points. So the next thing you have to pick once you've decided on your pin system, your roof system, is you have to Pick how are you going to maintain this vapor barrier and form your corners on the, the system prior to installing your finished lagging. Um, we choose to 
manufacture fabricate uh, three inch by three inch 016 smooth aluminum eight foot long 90 degree moldings we make them in our fabrication shop uh, you can usually talk a sheet metal contractor into fabricating them for you if you don't have that ability and it combine that with the three inch wide commonly used pressure sensitive foil tapes and you can complete your vapor barrier uh, it's very critical to the success of your system the aluminum corners are going to give you uh, a real crisp corner a real good look a very rigid corner uh, much preferable over just a taped corner which may meet a specification but visually won't be as is pleasing and is not as durable um, you'll find these aluminum corner moldings are a real time saver in the long run um, they they in, 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 in effect they speed up the process of the installation so the vapor barrier is critical to the success of the polyiso insulation or any insulation system is uh, it's a critical component so at this point what we would consider this project roughed in. We've got the insulation, the pins, the corner moldings, the vapor barrier is intact. Um, I'm gonna take a bit of a segue to safety. Um, there's a couple points I have on safety. When pinning the duct workout, it is not advised to pin the top of the duct. Uh, you wanna use gravity, your corner moldings, your pressure sensitive tape to hold your pitched roof onto the top of the duct. Pins on the roof of a duct are a real safety hazard for the duration that that duct exists on the roof. Although it's not recommended and people aren't supposed to walk on top of the ductwork, it's, uh, it does happen. And with pins on the roof, it's a giant safety hazard. Another safety hazard that comes along with pins are you don't want to leave exposed pins on the roof for any long extended periods of time. Um, if you have to leave pins out on the roof, a great tip is to take some scraps of your polyiso board, maybe three inch by three inch, and impale those on your pins that uh, are gonna be out there overnight or over the weekend or over a period of time, uh, especially in high traffic areas. Uh, pins can give nasty injuries and they can really slow down the progress of a project. The, uh, we'll get back to pins. Um, with some more ideas I have on pins, but uh, the next choice you'd have is to choose your cladding. So what to look for in a cladding. Um, the claddings I like are lightweight. Uh, they're lightweight to prevent the delamination of the layers that make up the polyiso and, and the vapor barrier. Um, my example for that is EPDM, if people are familiar with the product, is very heavy. Um, when bonded to many insulations, it has a tendency to delaminate the foil facings from the insulation because of its weight. So when you're choosing a cladding, you got to look for a product uh, that matches up with the composite, the insulation you're using. In this case, we're using polyiso. And my number one choice for this application is a venture clad or ideal seal type product. Uh, it's a self-adhesive, lightweight, very strong, puncture resistant. Um, we have a it's great success rate for applications. As with all products, you need to follow the manufacturer's written instructions for application. Um, temperatures are something you're going to want to watch, um, and that that is a uh, a big concern when putting on these self seal products is to make sure you're inside the manufacturer's recommended uh, temperatures. Um, so to protect your cladding and to protect your roll goods out on the roof uh, on this next slide, in, in consideration of having the, all this material out on this rooftop, you want to make sure you maintain the integrity of the insulation, the polyisocyanurate. It's going to install a lot better if you keep your material covered, clean, and dry. Uh, storage out on the roof. It's always problematic. You want to give a specific focus to making sure that the polyisocyanurate is covered, it's clean, and it's dry. Uh, that means the unused portions where you stopped uh, in our finish what you started procedure, the overlaps over the weekend, overnight, a 
piece of plastic, a tarp over those, they're going to save you heartburn and a lot of uh, lost time waiting for things to dry out from dew, from frost, overnight rain. Uh, it's very important to keep these products out of the weather and out of the sun until the installation is complete. Uh, I have a tip to cheat physics on the cladding. Um, when, you're, when you have your rolled goods, your foil tapes, your ideal seal, your venture clad, it's a great idea as the weather cools off to keep those rolled goods in heated spaces and keep them warm, uh, especially on overnight. If you can keep your rolled goods at ambient or you know 75, 80 degrees inside, nice warm storage. When your crews arrive on the roof at oh dark 30 and there's been you know, a bit of cold over the night, uh, you can cheat physics by taking your warm roll goods out, uncovering your protected work in progress, and your crews can get right to work uh, installing because your products are inside the manufacturer's recommendation and uh, you can keep your project moving as the sun comes up and the day warms up. Um, I'm going to go back to pins for a second. Um, on the next slide, I have some tips on pins and some uh, details on pins. So it's very important to be consistent with the pins and layout. They're a big feature in this product as a finished. You can see them. You can see where the pins are located. Um, so a couple tips I have. Uh, number one tip is finish all your pins the same. Uh, that would be you identify that you're going to bend them over with a speed washer. You're going to cut them off or you've used cupped head pins and there's the cupped head side of the washer that's in your polyisocyanurate board. My next tip is take some of your cladding, a four inch by four inch square, uh, go through each and every pin location, and place it. Uh, that square cladding over that washer, over that cupped head pin, and seal it down. It's going to do a couple things for you. Number one, it's going to get you to go back and inspect each and every pin to make sure it's secured right, it's sealed right, it's clipped off, it's bent over, it, it meets your detail. And then the possible failure point on this system outside is a pin protruding through your jacket. So at this point, you're over you're over engineering the pin location with a double layer of cladding. It also cleans up the surface of the polyiso board to give you a great finished appearance. Uh, on the next slide uh, is how to improve your specification. Um, a lot of times you get to the job, you have a spec to meet, and it, it gives you the general consensus of what the goal is, it's to insulate this external duct out on the roof. But sometimes it leaves out a lot of important details. And I want to identify some of those details in these systems. The number one uh, detail I find a problem with in this application are the roof penetrations. And that would be where you change materials from the poly ISO penetrating the roof curb, and you incorporate your indoor duct spec, which is could be a, a, a duct wrap or a duct board. Um, that's a failure point, and it's important to get that detail worked out before your crews are on site of whose responsibility it is to seal the curb, whose responsibility it is to seal the duct to the curb to keep the water out of the building. Uh, I think that's your number one risk in this application is the, the roof penetration. Uh, another possible failure point would be a wall penetration, uh, although not as problematic generally as a roof vertical penetration. They can be problematic. Uh, you have to make considerations the way you pitch your roof to make sure you're not funneling and channeling moisture into the penetration. Uh, so you have to be proactive. And you have to sit down with your engineer, your general contractor, maybe a roofing contractor, and you got to work these details out. It's important to do it before your crews are on site. Um, the next thing I want to move to on how to improve your specs is duct supports. Um, polyisocyanurate has a fantastic compressive strength, and you can use that to your advantage and coordinate with the sheet metal contractor. 
and get those duct supports located outside of the insulation system. That cuts down on a lot of failure points, it cuts down on a lot of flashing, it cuts down on a lot of caulking. It's going to save you time, it's going to save you money. The supports can be located outside of the insulation in many cases. Um, you want to coordinate that with the engineer, your sheet metal contractor, and yourself. And this can really be a, a big advantage you have on a big rooftop duct job if you can get your supports located outside. And that would include seismic res, uh, restraints as well. Um, the seismic restraints, in many cases, can be located on those hangar supports that are now located outside of your duct insulation system. And that really saves a lot of penetrations and a lot of time on the job. Um, so those are my basic points on, you know, how I would approach uh, a rooftop duct insulation with polyisocyanurate. Um, so I welcome your questions and, and I thank you folks for your time. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I did want to take a couple minutes to go through some additional resources that we have um, available at Johns Manville. And we um, strive to make sure that we're offering you guys plenty of educational opportunities and um, resources for when you're looking for information. And they can come in the form of training, tools, we have a blog, um, webinars like you're attending today, and even product specification pages. And we have combined all of these on the source. Now, the source of location where we host our recorded webinars, we have a specifications page where we have all of our specification content for each of our products so you can do a side-by-side -side comparison. We have access to our blog, a brief description of each of our products, um, pretty unique tools, and I'll touch on those here in a minute, as well as training opportunities. Now, in our tools section, what we have, um, we have things like a 3E Plus tool that we've customized with JM-specific products. So um, for those of you who use the 3E Plus tool, you know that you enter in your specifications that you want for your product, and this will actually output the materials or the, the thickness of the JM materials that you need. And then in addition to that, we have, um, we have an app called Smart Binder, and this is one you can access on your computer or you can download to your, to your smartphone. And um, basically, it, it gives you instant access to all of our data sheets, documents, technical, data, uh, technical information, safety data sheets, that sort of thing. So um, when you want to watch this webinar, assuming you want to watch it again, you'll be able to come back here to the source and find it. And, um, you know, just another thing to note is that on our blog, we have, um, we, we write the content with our in-house experts, and then we also scour the web and find the latest um, technical content from, from experts throughout the industry so that you're not just getting a one-sided view, you're getting really robust, rich information. Um, now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you will get a certificate of completion for attending the live webinar today, and that's going to be sent to you by Friday. And then at the conclusion of the webinar, we will have a survey that goes out when you close out your screen. And basically, um, we use the survey for a couple of reasons. One is if you have any questions you can't or don't get to ask today, you can submit them via the survey. Or if you want to request a technical presentation, it's an opportunity for you to reach out to us directly and ask us to contact you for that. Um, but we also want to hear your feedback, see what you have to say about the presentation, and, and learn from you about what we can do to improve this to make this a better experience for you and more helpful for you. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and take it into some of the questions. Um, and the first one here is for you, Brennan, and that is, um, is your 4.4 inch wrap a three quarter pound density? Uh, yes, uh, when we come out with the product here in a couple more weeks, uh, it will be a three quarter pound type 75 product, just like all of our normal uh, duck wrap products. Great, thank you. Um, Tom, the next question is for you, and that is, what is snow loading? So snow loading in the Northeast is it, uh, very common in, in many parts of the country. Over the course of the winter months, uh, the snow falls, it builds up, it melts during the day, forms ice, gets heavy, more snow falls, builds ice, gets heavy. Um, so the trick with uh, what I was re referencing in pitching roof and snow loading would be that as that water melts, as that snow starts to melt, get the water to run off the duct so it doesn't form those big sheets of ice. The snow loading can add anywhere from 30 to 60 pounds a square foot in the Northeast. And if you can keep that reduced, you can keep deflection down on the roof of the duct and that's gonna help your system last. Great, thank you. Um, Brennan, how well does R12 duct liner cut on a rotozip machine? 
Uh, good question. We did do some testing on the RotoZip equipment. Uh, it cut without a problem. We had to order a, a special three-inch cutting bit. Uh, it took a couple weeks to get in. Um, and, and a lot of the manufacturer's programs now, um, as you put your layout into the system and in the computer system, as you get thicker and thicker with insulations, it requires a little bit more spacing in between your fittings. Um, so make sure that you are adding an accounting for that so that the bit cycles and, and properly goes in and out uh, of the material. But we did test it and cut it, and it did, it did perform on that uh, piece of equipment. Great. Excellent. Lance, this next question is for you, and that is, is polyisofoam waterproof? Yeah, so waterproof probably has legal connotations. I would say that the product is very moisture resistant. Uh, the insulation is closed cell. Uh, so it'll tend to keep moisture out uh, through that closed cell mechanism. And then it has a foil facing on it with a low perm rating, uh, which is the measure for uh, how we evaluate uh, vapor retarder jackets. And, and with that, so uh, it is a very moisture resistant product. Great, thank you. Brennan, what pin length would you recommend for an R12 liner? Uh, good question. Uh, so all, with all of our pins, we typically recommend a, a one-eighth one -eighth inch uh, compression uh, of the pin once it's applied and, uh, and mechanically adhered. Um, so for a three-inch product, I would say two and seven-eighths inches. Um, they are out there. There are some manufacturers that do provide those for our trial and testing purposes. We did have to special order them with some of the people we were uh, doing the trials with. So it took a couple weeks to get them in, uh, two to three weeks as a special order item, but they were able to secure those. Um, we did try some three-inch pins as well that were available, and they, they did work with the pin spotting equipment. So I, I would recommend a two and seven-eighths inch pin for the three-inch product. Great. Thank you. Tom, this next question is for you, and that is, is it necessary to insulate an outdoor air intake ductwork on a roof? So I'm envisioning a common application of a rooftop uh, AHU, and it's got a piece of ductwork that brings the fresh air from some place on the roof, maybe seven or eight feet away, and, and, and that's the intake for the air handle unit. So unless you have a preheat coil and you're putting some kind of energy into that air that you're going to pull into your your air handle unit. Um, that piece of ductwork is essentially ambient at whatever temperature the outdoor temperature is. So it'll neither lose energy or sweat or or do anything problematic on on the roof. So you don't need to mechanically insulate that snorkel unless you have some sort of energy you're putting into that uh, air to preheat it before it goes into the unit. So, uh, Brennan, the next one I have is for you, and that is, um, what would you recommend for a cool system operating about 50 degrees Fahrenheit? Is it safe just to line it, or do you have to wrap it, too? Uh, sure. Good good question. So, um, kind of two different parts of that question. I would say the number one reason why you uh, line ducts is for acoustical purposes. It does provide proper thermals um, and can help with condensation control as long as the duct is sealed properly. So. There are, there are some things that can be done, but duct lining is especially done for acoustical control. Um, Tom, on, on the wrap side, uh, you know, I'll use our resident expert here on, on mechanical insulation in the field. you want to talk to the wrap piece of that? Sure. Um, you know, on that question, it's a little open-ended. The, the, the location is really important to where that duct liner is installed. Um, if it is in a conditioned space, uh, in a return air plenum, perhaps. Um, the ambient temperatures from the ductwork discharge temperature and the air in the plenum are going to be very close. But in, uh, I'm going to assume this is in a, uh, an unconditioned space where this unit is is uh, sending out. It's not in the space it serves, and you need a vapor yeah. barrier and you need to insulate it so that you can keep the duct from condensing. Great, thank you. So, Lance. Um, you spoke a little bit about vapor barriers earlier. Are all vapor barriers created equal, or is there a lot of variation between them? Yeah, there definitely can be vapor or variation uh, in a vapor barrier. Generally, what you're looking for is a vapor barrier with a, a perm rating of one or lower. And a perm rating is kind of a measure of how moisture flows. So moisture works kind of similar to heat, where you have high concentrations of moisture it's going to want to flow into an area of low concentration. So your vapor barrier is designed to slow that down. So the lower the number, the less 
uh, moisture is transmitting through that barrier. So something like the fiberglass board, uh, spin glass product, uh, that vapor barrier has a perm rating of 0 0.02, uh, and then um, others range from there in terms of effectiveness. Excellent. Thank you. Brendan, our final question is for you, and that is, um, what are the lengths and widths that I can get R12 duct liner in? Uh, sure. So uh, the length of the roll for all of our, our R12 product is going to be a 50-foot roll. That's a lot of material to wind up and, and roll up, so it keeps us within our packaging diameter, so 50 foot in length. Uh, right now, initially, uh, we've offered a 59-inch wide uh, product. That's what contractors have asked for initially, which is a very popular width. Um, I fully expect there to be other sizes or widths that are asked for um, that will come out depending on different metal connections, but that's kind of where we'll start. I'm, I'm not going to put in a ton of a different widths and stocking skew items until we really get a feel for kind of where this is going to go, um, but that's where we're at right now, I, and I expect us to have more than that in the offering soon. Perfect. Thank you. So that concludes our questions. As I mentioned um, at the beginning of the webinar, when you close out your window, you will get a survey. Um, you can reach out to us if you have any questions you weren't able to ask today, or you can um, request a technical presentation, and of course, then we would always love to have your feedback as well as how we did today. Um, you will get your certificate of completion for attending the live webinar, and that's going to be emailed to you by Friday. And once this webinar is um, we recorded and complete, we will post it online and we'll send you an email with direct access to that as well. Thank you very much for your time today, and we will talk to you soon.